Welcome to this edition of the Resilient Professional Podcast. In this podcast, we're going to talk about four words that start with S that powerfully put you in the focus state for greater productivity. As well, we're going to talk about an amazing paradox that helps you to be more productive through your day. And finally, we'll talk about a reset process so you can stay on task through your week. Welcome to the Resilient Professional Podcast. Professional success really is a game of inches. You have the experience and knowledge, but you realize that professional success is more than just knowledge and experience. It's actually applying what you already know. It's about consistently applying what you know in spite of the challenges that are sure to come your way. You know, Olympians know how to battle adversity and to perform at their best, even in the midst of setbacks and frustrations. I think we can learn a lot from the Olympian mindset. It really is about the cultivation of resiliency. Physical resiliency, emotional resiliency, relational resiliency, cognitive resiliency, resiliency in each aspect of our lives. On a regular basis, we'll unpack these ideas through guest speakers and podcast material that will take you to the next level of professional success. Simplify, small, short, and slow. And when you merge all these words together, you develop what's called the professional sweet spot. So let's unpack this a little more detail. First of all, we'll talk with small. Well, small means breaking down your big goals into tiny chunks. Accomplishing little goals creates little wins, and this always creates motivation. Use the overall goal as a rudder or a beacon in order to establish your daily steps. Second S, short. It's amazing how much can be accomplished by doing small tasks consistently for short periods of time. I'm going to do this task for 30 minutes, and I'm going to stay focused. And when I'm done... I'm ready to go to the next task. The next S word is slow. Slow is working at a task where you can pay attention to what you're doing. Slowness has a paradox attached to it. Working at a slow pace, you can accomplish more because you're not bleeding away your precious energy through anxiety or frustration. As well, deliberate slowness changes your perception of time. You will lose your sense of time. Now, when you first do this, your ego will scream at you to pick up the pace, but over time, your real self will realize that the value and the virtue of this practice is amazing. Your anxiety will fall, your frustration will drop, and you will come into the performance zone. At first, you may not find this process easy to do, but make it part of your daily process, and over time, it will become just a natural discipline. Now, make sure you're aware that if you're tired, this discipline becomes more difficult. So if you're going to practice this daily focus, make sure you do it at a time during the day when you have peak energy. But more and more, your observer self will become more in tune and observant to what you're doing. Your goal is to strive to be in this mode most of the time. Now this is a lifetime journey. It's not easy. But it's an ongoing process that's important to cultivate and improve upon. So in summary, I'd really encourage you to practice the four S words. Simplify, small, short, and slow. You know, it's so easy once we get into our day to get full of anxiety and frustration and rush around, thinking that by rushing around and being intense, that's the way that we're going to get things done. But the irony is that by slowing down, taking your time, being in the zone, and then chunking off your activities applying the simplify, small, short, and slow process, you'll be in the professional sweet spot and that over time you'll actually get more accomplished with less energy and more calm. Now let's take a look at a couple of other areas that really will enhance your professional experience through the day. And I think it's something you can really apply to your personal and family life as well. And that's cultivating two really important traits, the the trait of calmness and the trait of even-temperedness. You know if somebody has these two traits, when they remain undisturbed and they don't experience swings or major changes uh, based on, you know, evolving circumstances in their lives. I think many of us sort of have a grudging respect for those kind of people who can remain even-tempered and calm in the face of change and challenges going on in the workplace. These changes don't seem to bother them. They've mastered the art of being non-judgmental. You know, we just naturally judge everything right from the moment we wake up. It's a natural process. It's as natural as breathing air. It's just the way we're hardwired as human beings. 
Judgment requires a point of comparison, a comparison or an ideal, something that we imagine we want to have, the ideal version of what we want to be doing. Now, judgments are necessary in order to function in life, right? It's a, it's a natural part of how we live, but there's a downside to judgments and judging. The reality is judging does not come without some extra baggage. And the primary baggage that comes along with judging is emotion. And the amount of emotion is tied to the importance of the issue attached to the judgment. The problem is that emotions cloud our thinking and our judgments. You know, we've talked in past podcasts about the impact of the amygdala, which is sort of our fight or flight uh, part of our brain that it attends to you know, protecting us using the fear mechanism. And what happens is when you trigger the amygdala, it begins to shut down uh, the functioning of your prefrontal cortex to the point that your cognitive abilities begin to be compromised. And so emotion is something we have to be very attentive to because it does lead to judgments and evaluations that can be subpar. So emotions are generated from things like this is right or this is wrong. This is good, or this is bad, or this is the ideal. And so we go through our lives, we go through our days, we go through our weeks, constantly going through a process of judging, whether it's judging other people's driving habits, whether whether it's judging other people's driving habits, judging the quality of our meals, judging the quality of the speaker, judging the quality of foods, judging the quality of podcasts, judging the quality of books that we read. It's a constant process. And as a result, as we go through these ongoing judgments, as we compare against our version of the ideal, it creates low-grade anxiety and stress in our lives. In order to eliminate or reduce this habit, we need to become more objective and aware of ourselves and our internal dialogue and thinking. You must become aware of your true self. So what are some ways that we can be in tune with that true self? Well, when you become aware of what you're doing, This implies there are two entities involved. One is the part of you that's doing the activity. And then two, a part of you that is observing you doing that activity. If you're talking to yourself, you likely think you're talking. But who really is doing the talking? And who's really doing the watching and the listening? Well, the answer is your true self. The one talking is your ego. The one observing and listening is your true self. It's called the observer, the observer self. The more you align to the observer, the less you begin to judge. Your internal voice begins to calm down, and you become slowly more detached from the external stimulus that drives the expression of your ego. Detachment means you'll often observe the internal dialogue with amusement. You'll kind of smile to yourself. You'll be surprised at the um, immaturity, lack of wisdom that sometimes comes out of your ego. You can say to yourself in those moments, that's just my ego fretting or worrying that it'll experience you know, disapproval or maybe people won't like me. You become less agitated by other people's behavior once you become more detached from your ego. Over time, you'll begin to rise above your ego. And that sense of detachment will allow you to be actually more effective through your day. So when we talk about the ego, here are some characteristics that will really clue you into that the ego is sort of driving some of your internal dialogue. The ego is often subjective, it's not really making comments based on facts. It's judging, and it's never content. It's never content about what it has, where it is, and what it's accomplished. Now, the observer self, on the other hand, has the characteristics of being objective, about being present moment, and rising above the experiences, being non-judgmental, non-emotional, I think a great phrase to summarize what happens with the observer self is, life happens, I need to roll with it, and I need to deal with it, but I don't have to necessarily get my ego involved with it. The observer self leads to an objective. The observer self leads us to a more objective point of view, right? No expectations, just objectivity, compared to the ego, which says things like, be the best, second doesn't count, I want it all. One of the most effective ways of engaging the observer self is actually through things like prayer and meditation. Quite frankly, prayer and meditation is about quieting the mind and becoming more detached from our external environment. And when you think about meditation or prayer, it's great to think of the short form DOC, and that stands for D is do, 
always observe and see is correct. The most obvious application in this principle is in the world of sport. Think about something as simple as shooting hoops to play basketball. Let's say you're at the, the free throw line and you're practicing your, your shot. Well, you do. And when you shoot, you observe that shot. And then based on your success in that shot, you will correct. You'll change your technique, your stance, your follow through, the angle of the ball. And you'll keep doing and observing and correcting until you get into a groove that ends up being successful for you. Golfing can be the same way. Archery can be the same way. Maybe playing darts, playing pool. So sports is a great illustration to this notion of do, observe, and correct. But you can apply that to almost any activity in life. Let's look at something like emotions. Let's look at worry. Okay, so point number one, under doing, you catch yourself worrying. You're in the do part of the process. Number two, once you catch yourself, right, and you begin to observe, you become part of the observer stage. Okay, I'm worrying. I want to observe what I'm doing in that moment. It is at this point that the emotions you're experiencing will not help you to solve the problem, obviously. Okay, so you you do, you observe, and now you course correct. So when you correct, you release yourself from the emotion and try to look at the problem as an observer, not from an ego standpoint. When you start to fret again, you repeat the cycle. Do, observe, and change. And you keep repeating the cycle and repeating the cycle, and eventually, when you're in those circumstances that normally create worry for you, you develop, you develop these course corrective mechanisms so there's not as much worry, and worry, when it does arrive, you get through it much more quickly. Now, at first, it's very hard, right, because you're breaking old habits and patterns. But over time, of course, it will become easier. Now, it's really important that you don't confuse the notion of judging with evaluating. They're very different things. Evaluation really implies an objective, non-emotional approach to something. Of course, judging involves the ego and, of course, emotion. Of course, we all have to evaluate before any task. That's just appropriate to do, but don't mix up the notion of judging. That's not a productive state of mind, and it's not a productive habitual response. The other thing we have to keep in mind is our ego is constantly judging during a task. Right? You can be doing something, and rather than doing, observing, and correcting, you do, and when you observe, if you're off the mark, your ego steps in and starts judging, and that creates anxiety and concern and shame and you know, worry, all kinds of negative emotions. So make sure that you understand that you need to always be at the ready to have your observer self ask questions about, is my ego getting in the way here? Is it judging my performance? Because the minute you start judging, not just others' performances, but your own, you begin to compromise your ability to get work done effectively. So the purpose of do, observe, and then obviously course correct is to self-correct before your ego gets involved in the process. Nothing is more satisfying than shutting down the squawking voice of your ego. Over time, with practice, you'll become much more aligned with your observer self and become a detached from that crazy talk that creates anxiety and stress and concern. You want to get to the point that when those emotions do come into your life, you end up dealing them with as, as a choice Okay? Sometimes emotions can be productive. They can be strategically used. There's no doubt about that. But you want to go from these habitual knee-jerk responses when you're in different circumstances to making a conscious choice about how you're going to handle the emotion in that moment. So when you get engaged in this process, just be aware that it's hard. You're breaking habitual patterns. Take baby steps. Always remember that these shifts take a lot of energy, so have reasonable expectations about how much you're going to accomplish. Remember from our previous podcast that it's a process. Begin with the end of mind, right? You don't have to get it done this week. Just incrementally every day try to make these improvements. Well, I hope you found these concepts helpful. I think the, the whole notion of, of do, observe, change is just really critically important. So remember, cultivate the observer self. When you're doing activities, when you start hearing that chatter in your mind, that's your ego when you're struggling with embarrassment or what will other people think or you're no good at this, stop that stuff, okay? Step back, try to be detached and look at what you're doing, observing what you're doing. And as you observe, look at how you can correct those activities, 
change your behavior, do a reset, and keep going through that cycle until you change over time. It's a very, very simple strategy, but very powerful. But it, but it does take this notion of self-awareness, that you'll actually listen to yourself, observe yourself, so you can see these unproductive patterns and habits in your life. Well, that concludes this edition of the Resilient Professional Podcast. really hope you enjoyed these concepts, um, the concepts of the four S's, and of course, the concept of do, observe, change. Uh, be sure to take a look at the, um, the show notes for this particular podcast as well. Please feel free to download the free transcript of the podcast as well. The PDF document that you just click on the link and it's right there for you. I'd encourage you to take a look at the ebook, uh, The Resilient Professional, 15 chapters of great content designed to help you in the journey to be professionally resilient so you can be not just effective during times of change professionally, but also effective in your personal life. All the best as you strive to be resilient.